Okay, everyone, and welcome back to TFT 12. Uh, unfortunately, our next presenter, Tristan Boot, is unable to join us. Now, these are the things we have to expect with a live event like this and with people who are busy working in their day jobs, actually doing the job of service management. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Tristan's boss is unable to be at work today, so he's had to take over his role as well as managing his own day-to-day -day work, which did not leave him time for presenting at uh, TFT12. However, as we uh, had planned for these sorts of contingencies, I do have Tristan's pre-recorded video ready to go live. I'll just uh, quickly tell you a little bit about Tristan for those of you who don't know him. Anyone who follows Tristan on Facebook will know that he is a uh, foodie, I guess you would call him. He's a uh, very adept at taking amazing photos of food and posting them for us all to feel jealous when we are enjoying our baked beans or poached eggs on toast. Um, Tristan's a service manager at Vodafone New Zealand and he is also uh, the esteemed president of ITSMF New Zealand. Um, in his day job at Vodafone, he facilitates customer relationship management with various business units. He provides that uh, great ITSM subject matter expertise and he's actually very good at providing a little bit of comic relief when it is needed. Uh, as the ITSMF New Zealand president, he, uh, he leads a, a great band of volunteers in New Zealand. They're a, they're a pretty committed group and he, they provide some outstanding services and value to people throughout New Zealand. He's got extensive experience in customer service and is really committed to the customer service experience. His background and experience give him insight into the demands and needs of customers and the responses of service providers to these needs. Uh, Tristan's um, presentation today is entitled, If You Don't Like People, Then Perhaps You Shouldn't Work in Customer Service. Now I guess um, we've probably all come across people in customer service who really uh, don't like people that much. So. Tristan's uh, presentation is going to going to talk to those people and uh, talk talk about that uh, that whole customer service experience. So I am going to share my screen and hand you over to Tristan as he presents his uh, his presentation to you. If you don't like people, perhaps you shouldn't be in customer service. Just a good opportunity to sort of put it, put it out there for, for a wider audience. Nothing really, what I'm saying is is groundbreaking or is mind blowing, but it's just things that have been bothering me for the last few years. When I was talking about customer service and customer service culture, um, and not really always doing a particularly good job of, um, of of even starting. And so, what I've come up today is really just some you know some personal views that I've sort of noticed over the last over the last few years and um, thought I'd share them if it gets people thinking or if it points people in the, in the direction of somebody else um, who, who might be able to uh, give more detail I think that's a, that's a, a good and a, um, a, a positive step forward so basically my, my theory is that the, the days of the old uh, there's no polite way to say this bastard operator from hell uh, are gone. And, and really, the customer service is, is the way of the future. Now that, I know that's a bit fluffy, but if you think about it, a lot of the technology that we use today is being consolidated or moved to the cloud. Um, and so the premium now is really on the skills to interface between that technology and the customer, or the technology and a third party and the customer. So I think it's really, really important that we make sure that we keep that in, in our view for, for moving forward. You know, and people have said you know, customer is king. You know, if, if not necessarily the king, there's still somebody who can go elsewhere. So it's really important that we do everything we can 
to secure and retain them and to keep them happy. And I think that's the real, the real key. One of the first conferences I ever went to a, a number of years ago, keynote speaker got up and basically said, customers are a bunch of a-holes, which I think is possibly a slightly over-exaggerated way of looking at it. But what his point was, if you don't give them what they want, they'll go next door and get it. So I guess there's two ways of looking at that. We can either um, you know, just just flag them and, and, and let them go, or actually give them what they want in the, in the first place. It, it's been said in certain circles that customer satisfaction is, is really the only useful me metric. I don't necessarily agree with that in itself, but it is a key metric if you're trying, especially if you're trying to sell something and you want your customers to come back, or if you're, you know, if you've got internal customers, if you want them to actually stick around. So let's just say, it's a, for the sake of the argument, so at the top of the tree, there's a whole lot of discussions we can have around metrics, but um, now is not really the time. If we want to re remain relevant um, in this day and age, we really need to provide great customer service. And actually more than just great customer service, it's got to be memorable customers, customer service. You know, how many of us can actually hand on heart say, that they really do remember, um, you know, more than a handful of great customer um, service interactions that you've been part of or have seen. We certainly remember the crappy ones, um, but you know, remembering those really good ones is, um, is is what keeps us coming back. So to create those is a, a real driving force for your organisation. And by creating those kind of interactions, you know, you end up with happy customers, and happy customers inherently lead to happy employees, and that creates that you know that nice little cycle of profit that, that everybody likes for the organisation. You know, and basically all stakeholders are happy at that at that stage. Customer service requires um, a, a great customer service culture. That pretty much goes without goes without saying. But that culture needs to run throughout the organisation. I've talked in the past about it coming from the top. Everybody talks about it coming from the top, or, you know, top down or bottom up. But it actually needs to be fostered at all levels of the organisation, or it's just going to stay at the top or at the bottom, wherever you're trying to drive from, and not actually make it anywhere. So you've got to you know, get the roots in right across the whole organisation and really try and, and make that progress. So. It's really important at that point to realise that great customer service, we need, with full great customer service, we need great customer service staff who actually want to be there. Personally, you know, I knew that it was time for me to leave my service desk job. When I sort of started having reoccurring fantasies about grabbing customers by the hair and smashing your face into the counter, don't get me wrong. I did actually really enjoy my my, uh, my service desk job for for a long time, and this could possibly be a, an extreme example. But really, when it came down to it, it was a, it was a fairly dark time for me there for a little, for a little while, and I knew it was time to, to get out. And, and, and I've always kept that in the back of my mind. And lately, I've actually been been thinking about um, those you know the frontline customer service staff that we have, and. How many people in those roles really truly want to be where they are? You know, they may have wanted to, they may not want to want to anymore. You know, are they just being forced into it or, or forced to stay? A, a great example about that is the, the you know the backroom boys. You, know, you, you bring them out of their little dark room where they've been tinkering with their uh, the bells and whistles and little black boxes, and actually make them sit on the on the service desk and talk to the scary customers. You know, we all make them do it, and we all think it's a good idea, but is it really a good idea? Is it the best use of their skills? What does it actually do for their motivation and for, therefore, for the, um, the interactions with the, with the customers? It, it, it is really important to expose people to, to new things, and I've worked with people who have who, you know, who've come out of the, the, the back rooms and absolutely shone, have been fantastic, and I think there's a difference there between forcing somebody into it and giving them the opportunity. You know, make sure they're the right people, and if they do have a, an attitude for it, by all means, give them the opportunity to do that. But don't force them into doing something they're not um, you know, emotionally or mentally prepared for or set up for. 
the, the other option is we might be dealing with people who have actually fallen into the role. And that was me when I was in, in, in that kind of role. I had, I come from a, a completely different background of you know, horticulture and plant conservation ecology. I ended up working on the service desk because I'd been you know, to university and new computers. And what can often happen in that case is that people feel that they can't, that they can't escape. And you know, we need to think about how many of those people that we've actually got in those roles actually have a real inbuilt desire to work in customer service roles. You know, I, I fell into IT, obviously, but I had done a lot of customer service stuff before, and I do, I am passionate about customer service. But again, I guess, I guess that shows that you've got to be in the right, in the right role. You know, even if they do want to be there, how often do we actually strip it away from them through 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 bad management or um, you know lack of lack of opportunities or any number of other of other factors? We really don't value those at the bottom of the ladder enough. And, and let's face it, service desk is still seen as the bottom of the ladder. I'm using service desk as an example here, but you know this could be any frontline customer customer staff. They generally are the ones you know we, we all talk about them being the coal face of the organisation. The, you know, the most important part of our operation. But do we really mean that? How often is the service desk the most well resourced I mean, part of an organisation or, the, or the, the, the most well trained? You know, generally they're just the people who get there, who get the, um, the project thrown over the fence at the last minute and say, oh, by the way, we're going live with this today. Um, and you must support it. You know, that only has to happen a few times and you start to realise that you're not really valued. How fulfilled are the staff that you've actually got working for you? Do they see a career path? Or are they just filling in their days until something better comes along you know, and that, that's if it actually ever does? Given that we may actually have staff who, who are there and engaged and who, are want, who want to help, how long is actually too long to stay around? And this is one of the central things that got me thinking about this, this whole you know, ramble that I'm on at the moment. Is that actually, is that a problem? Some people you know, think that it's not, but I, I really do think it is. Because we've all seen that the service desk staff who have been service desk staff since before the concept of service desks or staff actually existed. Admittedly, some of them are made for it. You know, they remain customer focused. They love what they do, but they actually, from my experience, are, are in the minority. Others are simply going, going through the motions, or they're, they're sitting there without direction, or they're too lazy, unmotivated, or, or possibly stupid to move on. The question that we need to ask is: Are any of them doing the customers any good? Yeah, I'm not saying the lack, there's a problem with the lack of ambition. Not everybody has to be the most ambitious person in the world. And a lack of ambition can be okay, as long as it doesn't hurt customer satisfaction. Or lead to boredom, because boredom leads to being stuck in a rut. And eventually that leads to, to dissatisfaction. And you end up with your grumpy service desk stuff. You know, and how many times have you heard those little mutterings on the service desk, you know, when somebody finishes it, you know, with a with a particularly difficult customer. Or even worse, during, you know, I've I've, I've witnessed people, you know, putting somebody on hold very politely, but then just having a complete rant about about that person, you know, and, and actually walking around and talking to other people, not fixing the problem, just ranting, and then going back on and, and you know, indeed helping the customer. But to me, that shows that the cracks are really starting to show. Yeah, they might be they might be funny cracks at times. You know, some of those calls that, that, that come out are, are amusing for everybody around them. But and all they can see is actually is, is letting off steam. And I've you know I've, I've had that conversation with with service desk managers before. Oh, they're just letting off steam. But to me, they are signs of a failed or at least a failing failing culture. And something does need to be done. You can't do nothing about these. Because if you do nothing, things are still going to happen. In the, in the words of the great George Carlin, you know, what I'm talking about, I'm not concerned about all hell breaking loose. I don't think we're at that stage when you've got a few cracks like that. 
But I'm more concerned that part of the hell will break loose because that is much, much harder to detect. And then, how long is it before they actually start complaining about the nice customers? The ones with actual realistic and reasonable needs. So it's it's basically what we're saying here is at the top of a slippery slope. And that's a really sort of quick sort of background of, of, of where my thinking sort of came to around around service culture, you know, seeing it from those those things where those that cyber is breaking down. Um, and people are just letting things just slide and you, you know you get into that comfortable you, know, you might have people who've been there for for a long time or in a comfortable position um, and are just just seeing their days out and the thing is we've actually been talking about the role of culture for years and and years and years it's something we've just continually failed um overall to to get right as as an industry so what is this culture, this culture thing? How do we actually build a customer service culture? And you know, so again, as I said at the start, this is going to be a, a pretty a pretty quick uh, demonstration or, or you know, just some ideas that I've pulled together from some of the reading that I've done. And so, you know, hopefully it'll put, point in the direction of a few other people who are um, much more studied than me. But basically, to me, I see there are two key things to a customer service culture. The first is the employees and having the right employees there. And the second is having the correct management philosophy. And it's not just management support, it's management philosophy. So the first thing you really need to do is to actually define what you want the service culture to be. What does it mean in your organisation? And this is not necessarily something you're just going to be able to go and read out of a book. And you know, we're, I think you know, we're all sort of um, guilty of just you know wanting to get a template for anything from an incident management process to let's say hey, let's build a culture. But it's not that easy. You've got to do some work around defining the, defining the culture and what it means for you. You also need to explain why that customer service. Um, culture or why customer service is important, and that's explaining it to the staff and customers. So, you know, so both sides of the divide, so that everybody has their shared understanding of what you're trying to do. And a real is what you want people to remember. And there's a great, great example, and, and I encourage everybody to sort of um, search out Dennis Snow, um, wrote a book. Um, about his experiences um, 20 years plus in, in Disney, uh, a lot of stuff on YouTube and some pieces as well. But he talks there about, um, you know, thinking about the, the three things that you want customers to say about, about, your, about their experience with your organisation. And, you know, and that might be something, you know, you want them to just remember that, you know, it was friendly, the, the, the place was clean if you're a restaurant for, you know, or a restroom, for instance. Um, and you know, maybe the service is prompt. Because once you've got those three things, you can then actually use those to define the behavior that you expect to drive those outcomes. And that's a really, really simple thing for me that will help start defining that and driving that culture. And will basically increase the likelihood that um, they will tell others and, and they'll come back themselves. It's, it's really important to make it real. Uh, and make it a, make it a big deal at the same time as keeping it simple. Obviously, um, Jack Trout in the Paris Simplicity of it was a great um, uh, quote. There he talks about mission statements and keeping mission statements um, uh, nice and simple and easy to understand. You know, and I've spent a lot of time in universities who do like you know flowery three page mission statements that nobody actually reads or understands. Um, what Jack talks about in, in his book is is Volvo. Volvo have a 130 word mission statement and safety is word 126 and anybody who knows Volvo would expect that that would be you know up the front you know uh, what was what was the an 80s movie what was it Vol Volvo uh, boxy that they good perhaps they should have actually done that uh, mission statement instead um, the ones that I think have got it right you know you've got rat space um, I heard this on, on Chris's podcast last year um, you know fanatical customer support. That's what they do. Anybody who works at that customer, at that company, gets that. They understand it. I, I'm, I'm 
currently working for Vodafone, and um, part of our, 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 our statement is we're customer obsessed, and everything that we do to, to back that up is done with speed, simplicity, and trust. That's all you need to know. You know the Vodafone way, you can actually go about your work. You keep that at the forefront of every transaction that you do, and you're going to actually start very quickly building a, a customer service culture. Because once you've actually defined what you people what you want people to to do, you can actually or to to remember you can actually define the expectate expected behaviours of your of your staff, which is a really thing, you know, and put those into into job descriptions. Um, but actually, actually also have more informal discussions around it as well, and just keep people honest at all the time and, and aim towards those goals. It's really important to encourage responsibility for, for group performance. Um, and you know, it's too easy to hide otherwise. If everybody actually has that shared responsibility, it's going to encourage quicker, quicker dividends. Establish some customer friendly policies. You know, that might be around returns or anti spam laws or, or you know, um, early upgrades for, for um, loyal customers. Um, you know, do something around guarantees and, and warranty periods, and just make sure they're friendly and that people understand them. And just, you know, really, really important to make sure that everybody is on the same page and pulling in, in the right direction. You have to bring in the right people. It's, it's really important to recruit and hire the best possible candidates. And to deliver that effective customer service, it's vital that we actually commit and invest to get that great frontline staff. And that's not always the easiest to do. It's often more easy to sort of think, oh, we'll get a junior, we'll get a junior person in there and, and train them up. But if you haven't got the culture there, that's not going to happen. So it's really important that we actually do put some effort around that area. And you have to choose carefully, because if you don't choose carefully, the whole thing can turn into a complete train wreck. Tech skills themselves can be taught, and I'm living proof of living proof of that. You know, going from sort of growing trees to building building computers and installing network switches, but helpfulness itself is inherent. And so that's part of that choosing the people as well. I'm sort of saying, you know. It's um, probably more important to actually hire for the customer service skill set. It's definitely more important to hire for this customer service skill set than for any technical skills. The Southwest Airlines have taken it another step even further, and they actually hire for attitude and then train for customer service. And I think that's a that's a real uh, breakthrough because if you've got the you know the attitude, you're going to be able to pick up. Um, generally any of the skills that, that you need to, to do your job. So training is is really, really important. And and mainly around to actually enforce or reinforce those behaviours that you've actually defined as part of your 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 culture. And it has to be adequate to actually do the job. It's it's very really important not to underestimate the importance of the training. You never know where it's going to lead and, and what you'll actually get out of you know, encouraging um, somebody to, to go down a different path or to, to open your mind a, a little more. Unfortunately, it's really that the training budgets are, are often the first to go. As, as soon as the budget pinch comes on, we, we start to, uh, to, to get rid of the, the training. So part of the training should be customer service training. Um, but it's really, really, really important to realise that customer service training alone won't build the service culture. You need to do all those other things that we've already spoken about, and, and some of them we'll speak about coming up, but about you know, embedding and communicating it, um, making sure that everybody understands what you're, what you're trying to do. Hard skills also need to be taught. People need to know what they're doing to be able to do their job before they can effectively do it. You know, the best customer service person in the world, you know, I'm saying hire for attitude by all means, hire for customer service skills. 
but the best customer service person in the, in the world still actually has to be able to deliver something. You know, it might be, you know, the, the, the hard schools might, might be technical skills. And then there's also the, the process skills that people need, need to know about to actually understand how things fit together, how they can quickly get to the to the, 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 the nub of a, of, a, of a situation, who where they need to send things through to. The systems that they have to use to actually get their job done or to, to again to route it through to the right the right place. Um, but for me one of the things that actually gets lost most is the soft skills. And and this is you know the, the listening, you know, active listening skills, you know, everybody gets you touched upon it in, in some management training somewhere, but it's then forgotten and never encouraged and we really, really need to make sure that everybody is 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 able to, to listen. And to resolve conflicts. Conflict resolution is something that I think, um, especially in frontline roles, is really a, a really important part of the training that needs to be done. As is negotiation, you know, it's, it's you know, you're, you're on the phone dealing with, with with somebody yelling down the phone. You, know, you need to be able to negotiate. But even more important than that, I think, is troubleshooting skills. You know, I, the biggest problem I see with with non-functional service desks is the fact that the people on there don't have the skills to not necessarily be able to fix things, but troubleshoot, working out where they need to send. Um, you know, whether they need to, to route a call to, or, um, you know, how to, um, you know, classify and categorize a call properly, or, you know, set the priority right, because if that's not done, what you end up with is a whole lot of negative feedback loops. You know, the, the classic example of that is, is something being routed to the wrong to the wrong queue, and if you're monitoring, um, you know, your SLA monitoring is not up to, up to speed, it might sit there for two or three days before anybody but before anybody actually recognises, so you know what happens then is you know we end up with the, the IT black hole, and it's just a um, another black mark against us, and you know that's really not good customer service. So really, basically, you know what I'm trying to say is that you know, proper training, you're just you're just throwing your, your frontline staff to the wolves. Once they're trained, you really really need ongoing supervision and coaching. Yeah, and this is where the management trinity comes in, and, you know, the one-on-ones, the, one the feedback, and then, and then the coaching. You know, those three things are actually going to start building a really effective, a really effective team. Hard to do, hard to fit in, but really important to try to. It's then the, the key is to actually encourage accountability and response, group responsibility. I mentioned this before, but if everybody is actually not turning that blind eye and are willing to go the extra mile and just pick up a piece of work if they see somebody else struggling with it or if they happen to see that something sitting in their queue that's not supposed to be there to make sure that they put the customer first put the customer's needs first and take that extra time to actually reroute it or to find out where it needs to go to communicating examples of excellent customer service is is a, you know something that we, we don't often do. Um, it's always easier to sort of you know talk about what's gone wrong. I think it's really important that we everybody should be setting up a, a system that you know just even if it's informally. You know, that, that we when I worked on the service desk, we had a, a, a brand wall where you know you just put the put the emails up that people had, had sent you or. Um, you know the chocolate fish wrappers for this part of the world is a, it's a, a great, a great currency. You know how many of those have you got in the week? And it just gives gives everybody on the on the desk that little bit of encouragement. Um, and then you know, and anybody who comes in um, can actually read them and see them. And you know, the key is you know maybe not having it in the service, just putting it out in a, in a more um, useful useful manner so that other people can see it. Yeah. So that's and that's part of that recognition for what's for what's going well. You know, having a really a, 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 an effective reward and recognition scheme, and not just ticking the box to say that you've got one. It actually has to be something that actually is, is meaningful for for customers. And then after all that, if they don't get it, you may need to look at removing them. You know, and removing somebody is the final solution. And I'm I'm talking you know, 
it's, you know, you need to try and coach and train or maybe move them to an appropriate role. But actually, if you've got somebody in a frontline role who is continually not getting it and who is harming customer satisfaction, maybe the best thing to do is actually just to move them on. Customer feedback itself is important um, you know, in, in building a culture. Are you doing it right? Are the moves that you're making what the customers what the customers are? Again, this is a whole other large section. I'm not going to go into that how to actually how to actually do it. But you know, it is really important to actually get those measurements and, and where you're at. And I think, you know, and look at the gaps, you know, and, you know, the, the, the classic gap in between what what you know you think you're providing and what the customer thinks they're actually um, receiving as a service is is a really good place to start. So, having said all that, there's the really, really important part that we haven't really spoken about much, and is that that's the importance of, of leadership and of effective leadership in driving this in driving this cultural change. Yeah, I, I talked about how it's got to come across all parts of the, the organisation, not just not just from the top. But these are the guys who are going to be paying the money, um, and should be you know, walking the talk. Yeah, we always talk about buy-in from the top, and that is cliche, but it is it is true. But it's going to be more than just buy-in. It's actual, um, you know, they've got to be pushing it and actually living it, living it themselves. It's, it's buy-in to me always says, yeah, they're willing to throw some money at it, but they're not necessarily going to live the values. So there's a few things that I think management need to do if they're going to be effective in supporting culture. And, and the first one of those is having the appropriate knowledge, and that's the knowledge of the organisation, of the products and the services of the organisation, of the industry as a whole, as a whole, of the of the competitors. And really, what that does is means they can talk to anybody from across the organisation, and they should be talking to anybody from across the organisation. And what it'll do is it'll build confidence. You know, if you've got a a, a manager that no or a leader, you know, the, one of your corporate leaders who nobody has any confidence in who sits in the office and doesn't talk to anybody, that's not going to help build a culture. Whereas if you've got somebody who's out walking the floor and can talk to anybody in any of the of, of the parts of the business to you know a, a relatively well informed degree, they're going to be selling um, the culture a lot more effectively. Communication skills are, are hugely, hugely important for, um, for, for for leaders and managers. You know, they've got to be continually spreading that message you know, at, at all times. And you know, I, I'm guilty of myself of, of not communicating it sometimes as, as, as much as I as much as I should. But you've got to put things in place to actually encourage and force you to to, to do that to keep that communication up. Treating everyone with fairness and respect is a is a huge part of this, and it's got to be everyone. It goes back to also that you're getting out and walking the floor and talking to people and understanding what they do and what they do as a as a person, and not just being the stuffed shirt that sits up in the, in the office up, up upstairs. You know, don't pick favourites. Don't um, you know? Don't don't play favourites with, with people as well. Um, delegation, and this is a huge one, and it's you know allowing employees to actually take responsibility and, and exercise it in some cases limited decision making. This is obviously at the appropriate level, that depending on experience, education, and, and, and their position. But it's actually a key motivator for people. If somebody thinks that they've got some responsibility and some um, say in how their, their life's going to be affected by the changes that are, that are coming through, they're going to be on board you know, a, a, a lot quicker than if it's just something that they see a train coming down the tunnel towards them. Um, coaching and support, we've talked about this before, but it's, you know, this is, it is really important to have that regular praise as well as constructive feedback. Um, we all like to think that we're autonomous and we can just carry on and, and, and do our job regardless, but you know, it's actually really nice to have have direction and support from somebody. You know, for most of us, it will come from a um, a, a manager, um, but you know, often it also comes from from peer groups. But it's um, it's a it's a really important thing and shouldn't be underestimated. The the management leaders also have to work as an employee advocate. You know, it's often, especially when you're going through times of change and you're trying to you know, change your culture like this. 
Employees often feel management are more concerned about the bottom line than their, well, than their actual well-being. Um, and I think that's the key with when you're looking at the, at the cultural side of changes, to say what's actually going to be in it for them and how is this going to make, you know, not just the organisation better, but, but their lives better and their jobs, daily jobs better. Because it's really important to realise that customer service isn't easy. You know, the customer service professionals pretty much spend, spend most of their, deal, their day dealing with other people's problems. And that can be a really, really crappy way to spend your life. You've either got to be, be a saint or a complete masochist to really, really want to carry on and do that, do that role for you know for more than a, more than a few years. I'm, I'm talking you know that frontline frontline customer service role here. Um, I, th I think one of the things that we don't realise is just you know that, that burnout is really common, but it's not always recognised. So it's it's really important you know why you've actually got your team. To, to nurture them, to you know, pay at a competitive rate. It's really, you know, it's, this is, for those of you who don't know, this is our pretty coloured New Zealand money. But um, you know, do make that effort to actually, you know, take money off the table. Once you've taken money off the table, and it doesn't take as much as most people think to do that, it opens up, um, you know, a lot of other options to start looking at other motivators that you can really start getting the best out of your team with. Create a great work environment, and it doesn't need to be Google Slides and all those kind of things. But you know, it might be in some cases, you know, free, you know, free coffee, um, you know, or um, you know, open up the the old boarded up patio out out the back and um, you know, put a barbecue there, you know, free barbecue for people. To use. Simple stuff like that can really, you know, giving people space where they can actually go and interact with their with their peers. Um, you know, still in the workplace, but in a comfortable environment, so they can actually, you know, have um, conversations about what's happening. Provide state-of-the-art equipment and, and support to the employees. Yeah, this this is a small thing, but everyone loves toys, and if you're actually working on a on a front line, and you're using um, older equipment than most of the people you're supporting, it's not actually or only harder to do your job. There's a there's a little bit of a demotivator in there as, as well. Yeah, I can remember, you know, talking about loving toys, you know, when I was on the service desk, being excited about just getting a wireless headset, you know, and stuff like that. It does make you that little bit happier at work, which might make you a bit happier next time the next customer calls. Um, you need to develop your staff while you're there. And you know, I've talked about talked about the importance of, of training, but you know, just wanted to, to reiterate it. And it's not just developing them in that in you know, the training way. It's actually taking interest in them as a person and you know, sort of you know, developing the whole soul, I guess, is really what I'm trying to say there. Um, and then if necessary, help them move on. Uh, that might be, and hopefully it'll be to another part of your organisation, but it might actually be to somewhere else completely different. And I think this is part of this, um, this also does play in on the Probably most people think I'm well off track by now, but I think having the um, you know getting rid of the if I train them they'll leave mentality, um, that, you know, is is vital to actually having a great customer service culture because you've basically just got to throw your throw your head in the ring and say look we've got you guys here now this is what we're trying to do for our customers here's how you can do it best here's what we're going to do to help you if somebody then decides to leave if they leave on good good terms, they very well may come back. So I think it is really important to actually, you know, be prepared to let to let these let these people go. You know, it's the old adage if you love somebody, let it let it go. But you know, I've I've actually seen this happen a lot. You know, I don't want to delve into the whole um, argument around Gen Y versus Gen X, but um, or or even further back and the differences in how, how we approach work. But the, the theory that I have heard is that Gen Ys um, are much more willing to, to um, you know, we all know that the, the number of jobs that people are going to have these days is, is is increasing. But they'll also go back and if they're happy, you know, and so we're on currently working now, um, you know, the culture is such that even if people do leave, there's a whole lot of people come back, a lot, a lot of long-term people who, who have stayed there. But um, it's because it has got 
such a great culture, people might want to go and try something else, but they'll always return to what they need. So anyway, just to, to finish up my rambling um, last 30, 35 or so minutes, I thought I'd actually put some bullet points in here. I thought most people would probably be, I, I know I managed to slip a few words into some of those slides a bit earlier on, but um, I felt the need for some, for some bullet points. So basically, I guess if we're going to say anything about what I've talked about today, it's, it's about understanding your people. And actually, in defining that service, that service culture. And oh, actually, we'll go back. When I'm talking about understanding people, what makes them tick? Are they in the right jobs? What can you do to help them move into, into the right jobs if they're, if they're not? Um, yeah. So then, defining the service culture, and that's what we talked about. You know, finding the three things that you want them to to be be about, um, and then embedding that right throughout the organisation and getting everybody to to, to walk that talk. Um, you know, and as part of that, you might need to bring in the right people, and that might involve spending a bit more money than you want. But um, it's it's vitally important to have those right people, or develop the people you've got to make them the right people. But either way, you're going to have to invest at some level, um, and that investment includes training to reinforce the behaviours. Then, once people are actually in those roles, actually encourage accountability. Make people um, you know, individually accountable and responsible and group you know, responsible across the group for performance. And then basically sit back and watch the magic happen. So thank you. Um, I'm not sure if we've got any uh, if we've got any questions. Um, so if you have, I'm happy to answer some. Thank you. Well, thanks to Tristan in absentia, or I've just had a had a text from him. He he still is unable to join us, unfortunately. But uh, if you have any questions, do uh, email them through to him or uh, tweet them through, and uh, I will make sure he gets them. I mean, what I'd like to say was, didn't we all love that hairdo? Um, Tristan, that, that image is now burned in my mind. I'd just like to say you have got a few months between now and the next ITSMFNZ uh, conference next year. I'm sure if you avoided your barber in those uh, in the months in between, we could have a repeat of, of that um, fantastic uh, coiffure that uh, we saw we saw in that slide. Now, I do want to say, I mean, I, I, I did write a blog not that long ago about the service desk being a, a career destination. I think we do need to pose that question to ourselves. You know, how do we keep the right people on the service desk? Um, we lose them all the time. We train people up. We get fantastic customer service people, but they are always looking and they're saying, you know, where, where is it? Where can I go next? How do I get off the service desk? I mean, the service desk is such an important part of every IT organisation. You know, when you go to a conference, you ask someone, you know, what's your role? If it's a service desk, they're probably going to say to you, uh, I just work on the service desk. You know, you, you shouldn't think of it as, as just. I mean, you are, really are where the value of the IT organisation is judged. And you're the only place it can be judged because you are the doorway into IT. You're where the service comes from. So it's it's just such a, a critical role. And I mean, I don't know how we do it. I mean, I've got, there's lots of ideas out there. So if you've had any success in really retaining those fantastic people on your service desk, please share them. Um, and one thing I'll have to say, Tristan, you really made me feel old. That that typewriter you had on one of those slides, which I'm sure was supposed to be a museum piece, that really did look horribly similar to the first typewriter that was on my desk when I walked into my first day as a journalist on a daily newspaper. Um, it had probably been sitting on that desk for 45 or 50 years, I will admit, and it still worked. I would... Um, I doubt very much that in 40 years we would see a, uh, a computer that is working now still still functioning. So there was certainly some value in, in old technology. Well, I will say again a big thank you to Tristan for sharing his um, insights with us. We're probably going to have a little bit more of a gap than normal now since um, you must be sick of the sound of my voice. 
So I will sign off for now and you will see me again at the top of the hour when we join you again with April Allen. So go and get yourselves a coffee, stretch your legs a bit and uh, look forward to the knowledge bird in 15 minutes time.